I'm Oliver DeWolf. I know many of you. I, I wrote one paper with Hiroshi on defect conformal field theories and their EDS schools came from an idea of his. It was a very enjoyable collaboration. So thank you, Hiroshi. It's a pleasure to be here. So our first speaker this afternoon is John Gomez from Perimeter. We'll be talking about anomalies and symmetry fractionalization. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here to help celebrate Hiroshi's life so far. <laughs> and I mean, it's really, I mean, from the distance, I can see that it's really a very kind of multifaceted life that goes well beyond doing re research in physics, mentoring students and postdocs, but also like being very generous and taking leadership in, in kind of leading institutions and, and doing good things with it. So it's really a great honor to be here. I want to thank the organizers for doing all the hard work to organize this. I mean, that's, that's, it's great that you did, uh, you did this. So since it is a very special occasion, I, I, I will not do what Jan said and do the standard technique. I, I, will try, I will try to kind of start more with a little bit of retrospection and then have a little bit part of the, the technical talk on, that, that will follow from ideas in this paper. But the, the main idea will be to show you what, I, which I think is a, a nice, simple result that you can take home without getting too much into technical detail. So let's start with maybe reminiscing a little bit. So how did I get to know Hiroshi? So I arrived to Pasadena in, in 1999 after fin finishing my PhD under the supervision of Steve Shankar. And this was, I was very lucky that the year that I, I came to Caltech happened to coincide with the year that Hiroshi and Edward Witten uh, came here. So Hiroshi stayed, Edward stayed, uh, was here for two years. And it was really an amazing time. I have to say that there's, there's a small possibility that I'm remembering things with a rosier eyes than they were. <laughs> because, because I just got married, you know, I moved from Piscataway, New Jersey to Pasadena. You know, <laughs> I lived in a, in a beautiful guest house, very close to where you used to live. So it was really, a, but in my mind, it's still extremely rosy. And during that time, it was really an amazing place. I mean, uh, there were amazing faculty visitors, postdocs, students, and staff. People like Helen Pack, that, ah, that <laughs> many of you may or may not know her. She was an amazing person. Then Carol, which is another amazing person. And uh, I had the opportunity, uh, and I, I, as I say here, Caltech really provided a, a very warm, open, and a stimulating place. Like really, uh, 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 such an environment that, that's hard to match. And actually during this environment, I mean, it's one of the places in which I essentially was able to discuss with very many, many people. And actually I wrote many papers with many people. I mean, including faculty, visitors, postdocs, and, and in particular, uh, and even people in different areas. So I, I remember writing papers with, well, of course with Kiros, which I will discuss, but then with Anton, I wrote a paper with Anton, with Mark Weiss, which is my most phenomenological paper I've ever written. And one thing I'm very proud of, I wrote papers with a, an amazing fellow, which was a nuclear theorist. So it was just an environment where everything was possible. I mean, you could, we would go to the Red Door Cafe and start a discussion and, and things would happen. What is Michael? Sorry? What is Michael? The no, there was uh, Tom Meehan. Ah. Oh, and I also forgot, I, I wrote a paper also with, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the missing uh, Steve Kapser. Ah. Uh, yeah. So it was, really, it was really an amazing place and I, I really enjoyed my time here. So when I, I was at Caltech for this period, for five years, and during this time, Kiros and I wrote two papers. Uh, these are the titles. I will discuss a little bit what we did in this paper. I will not share about the other one. And then more recently, I was lucky enough that uh, with Nati and a whole bunch of other people, we collaborated again in this paper. <laughs> you have forgotten about it or? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's, it's kind of a paper that, Resolved a paradox that was kind of in in that field for a long time that somehow came to sharp focus in the in, the, in work related to what the, was the physical content of the of the three partition functions of Tukuma two theory. So it was a lot of fun. I will not say much more about it. Maybe Nati will say something more about it, but I, I don't know. So let, so let me, so one paper I'm, I'm I'm really that was really a lot of fun that I wrote with with you was this paper. So let me just say. This is a subject that is not so well known. So let me just say a few things that I, I think kind of were fun about this. So in, in this work, essentially what we did is we gave a, a microscopic worldship description of non-relativistic string theory. 
So there was another work actually by uh, Igor and Juan, which were taking a particular limit of some of closed Shakespearean flat spaces. They found that one could write down a series that had an, an, uh, an order of closed inspection. But there was no theory that would produce that. So in this paper with Hiroshi, essentially we wrote down kind of a, a two dimensional sigma model um, that had, as opposed to the usual polygon action that had relativistic symmetry, had Galilean symmetry, and that essentially gave a microscopic definition of what this theory is. So it has some nice features. It was unitary, we, had a, we, we proved a no theorem, it was UV complete, it had this funny string Galilean invariant. And it had one funny feature that, so this, this string theory, you still have to couple to Riemann surfaces, like in, in the usual relativistic string theory. And one very nice feature of, the, of this uh, particular Walsh theory is that the string amplitude is localized in submanifolds of the modular space of Riemann surfaces. And that just came from the structure of Walsh field, which is different than the one that you learn in book theory. So that was a really an amazing collaboration, and I, I really enjoyed it. And actually, uh, in recent years, I actually gone back and wrote a, uh, written a few, few more papers on this, uh, trying to kind of understand what we did here, which was work in flat space. Uh, essentially trying to understand how you generalize the work theory in flat space to um, a, a nonlinear signal model in curved space time. So essentially by following your, uh, the work sheet, the work sheet is king, is king. He or she tells you what, what she likes. Uh, so from that we, we were able to derive like what's the associated curved string geometry, which now is no longer a, a Lorentzian manifold, but something called string Cartan geometry. Uh, and we derived various things. Okay. So it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, so this is a, a, a kind of a, a collaboration that I really re remember very vividly because it was kind of very very fulfilling. Very good. So. We all know that Hiroshi has impeccable taste and aesthetics, not only in his physics and the way that he deals with people, but even in the way he dresses. <laughs> He's a, a born gourmand. I mean, Jan uh, already mentioned, one of the, the highlights of the day at lunch at Caltech was seeing what will be in that box. <laughs> it, was, it was really, truly a work of art. I mean, like, fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, and it's good, I mean, I think that, Kind of excellence or, or or demanding oneself excellent comes across uh, and people kind of grow with that okay. and Hiroshi you were very supportive and generous not only at the individual level but also as i said uh, as a builder like uh, you you, you help build the, the caltech community uh, with uh, and, and being the director of so many things that have really benefited well beyond individuals but just the field itself so thank you very much for that very good. So now I'll, I'll, I'll move to a more uh, actual content of, of, the, of the talk, scientific content of the talk. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll say very simple things, and then I'll hopefully I'll say something that maybe sounds a bit surprising, and that you can take home and think about it. So we cannot emphasize the, the importance of symmetries in, in physics. They provide a powerful organizing principle, okay? So, I mean, uh, Time is short, so I, I, I will try to go quite quickly to the point. So let's discard what we, we used to call symmetry, but now you, you have to qualify by calling it the zero-form symmetry. Uh, what, what is it? What is it? Form symmetry from a from a one perspective. Uh, you have a, a, a zero-form symmetry if you have a topological uh, invertible uh, co-dimension one operators in your theory. Okay. So what is a zero-form global symmetry? Essentially, it, it tells you how local operators in your theory transform uh, under that symmetry. And one important part about the definition of, of, of the, what is a zero-form symmetry is that the operator is transforming in vector representations of, of, of the global symmetry. Uh, a less well-known idea, but well-known to people that work in, in condensed matter, and in particular, the basic example in the fractional quantum Hall effect, is that a zero-form uh, a, a zero symmetry you can have in a theory that has a zero form symmetry, line operators can transform in general in projective representations of, of, of the global symmetry. So that's the first statement. And a famous example would be like the in the in the fractional quantum hall effect. Good. But one thing I wanted to say is that symmetries are great, but actually, in some sense, they don't tell you very, very much. 
essentially what they do is allow you to parameterize the most general answer compatible with the symmetry. So it doesn't tell you anything about the dynamics. Okay? This is in contrast uh, to the next concept I want to introduce, which is the concept of a tooth anomaly, which actually does inform about the actual dynamics that can happen. So a tooth anomaly cannot tell you what the dynamics of a system is, but it can tell you what the dynamics of a system cannot be. So that's already some progress. So in the space of all possibilities, it is narrowed it down to, to a subset. Okay. Now, how do, we, how do we diagnose whether a system has a, a tooth anomaly? What we do is we couple the system to a, to a, a connection, a background connection, background gate field for that. There is a, a kind of a dictionary between background connections and topological defects that uh, has been heavily used for many years now. And coupling to a background connection is, is kind of equivalent to saying that what you do is you lay down a network of topological junctions in your manifold. And this is, is another way of describing the same data. Okay. So what is the tooth anomaly? The tooth anomaly essentially is a non-invariance of the partition function and their background gates transformation for the global symmetry that cannot be cured by adding local counterpoint. Okay. So that's the kind of the official definition. And this has kind of a cohomological flavor because you're moving out by, by things. Okay. And that actually, what is the right cohomology that underlies anomalies? This has been one of the things where there has been a lot of progress in the last 10 or 15 years. A lot of work being motivated by by condensed matter physics. Okay. In the in in, in the language of topological networks, uh, the failure of the partition function to be uh, invariant is a statement that that which when you get transformation, the, the 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 network of junctions reconnects, and there can be a, an obstruction to these reconnections being consistent with each other. Okay. And that's one way to diagnose the existence of an anomaly from this point of view. An important point about anomalies is that they admit a topological classification. So they're described by a certain topological invariant. In the most modern language, it would be by a kind of an, an invertible field theory. And because they're topological, they mean that they don't depend on the energy scale and therefore they are the anomalization group invariant. And that's why they're useful uh, diagnosis of the dynamics of a system. Uh, where you don't have perturbation theory available. At least you can check whether the answer is not inconsistent with the dynamics of your short distance phenomenon. Very good. So in this talk, I, I want to ask the, 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 the following simple question. So what I want to ask is, is the tooth anomaly for the zero form symmetry completely determined once I give you the action of the, of the, the global symmetry on all your local operators? So I'm not going to ask you what, the, what you think the answer is, but uh, isn't there a famous theorem that the answer is always no? Someone, someone, uh, who, whose theorem is that? Is that your theorem? Sorry? I think that's not the original citation. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> okay. So and the answer is maybe surprisingly no. So if the system has uh, uh, one from symmetry, just specifying the action of, of G on the local operator is not, it does not uniquely determine what the zero form anomaly is. So this tells you two things. It tells you that even if you are kind of a hard nosed physicist and you said, I don't care about this one from symmetry, you know, what is this? Who cares about line operators? This tells you that you have to care about uh, one from symmetry because until you have really found them and specified them, the, the, the anomalies associated with the zero form symmetries uh, can change. Okay. So, in general, in order to describe zero form, zero form tooth anomalies, you have to understand the higher form symmetry. And essentially, you need to really understand whether your system has or, or doesn't have a, a one form symmetry. So, physically, what we need to do is to fully specify not only the action on the local operators, but the action of G on the line operators. Okay. And the point is that, uh, in general, there can be distinct ways. So there is a unique, so once we fix the action of, of, of G on the local operator, there can be more than one way in which the action can be realized on the, on the, on the line operator. And it's such distinct way in the condensed matter literature coming from the fractional quantum Hall effect, we, they call that fractionalization classes. And the point is that different choices of how G acts on the line operators can give rise to distinct tooth anomalies for the zero form symmetry. And this is, Something to keep in mind because usually uh, in tooth anomaly matching, you want to compare the tooth anomalies for some short distance theory to some large distance theory. And you may incorrectly throw away uh, 
a, a proposed infrared dynamics because the zero form anomalies don't match, but you might have been comparing them in different fractionization classes. So the, the more broader statement is that you should match two anomalies in all fractionization classes, okay? Because there is no origin of what it means to have a canonical fractionization class or action line operators. So you really have to compare them across all of them. And only then you can, well, if, if, if they don't match, then you throw them away. But if they match, you succeed. So, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that just comparing one value of the zero form anomaly is may lead you to incorrect results. Okay. So let me tell you one physical way to think about this metafractionalization. Okay. So the, the, the first statement is just now it's common common knowledge that the existence of a one form symmetry uh, is equivalent to saying that there exists topological co dimension two invertible operators in this theory. Okay. Again, the word co dimension two is, is it will be key here. So now, when we, uh, in order to see that there are different choices of how the zero form symmetry can act on the line operators is by studying this Mercedes Benz uh, picture. Essentially, what, what this is is just the junction, the fusion of two uh, elements of the zero form symmetry uh, like that. Now, the, the, the intersection here is at dimension two. So now you are, you're, I am free or you are free to enrich that junction by adding there a dimension two uh, surface uh, operator that generates a one-form symmetry, okay? So now, what does this do? The, of course, the, uh, uh, enriching the topological junction that tells you how you should couple to a background uh, gets you for the zero-form symmetry does not affect the action of, of, of the symmetry in the local operator. It can, it can modify the action of line operators uh, by phases. Essentially, because if I wrap a line around here, now the, 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 this, this red dot can detect the charge of the line under under the one form symmetry. Okay. So actually the, the action of, of, of the junction on the line operator uh, is modified by phase. Okay. And this change of phase of having the junction uh, having the red bullet or not can change the projective representation carried by the line operator. Okay. Now if you want to demand that this these things fuse properly and are consistent with one form chance conservation, one can argue that the choices are essentially labeled by a class in this uh, cohomology group. Okay. Essentially, it's the group of projective representations valid in, in gamma. Another way to think about this is that, which is totally equivalent, you can change one fractionation class into the other. Uh, essentially, you can change which red dots you insert there, essentially by turning on a background B field. This is the same as deciding, putting, removing, or putting different red dots into the theory. Okay. So you can change the fractionation class also by just turning on a background B field. So this B field, sorry, I should say what it is. So the, this B field is the gauge field associated to the one-form symmetry. It's kind of a two-form gauge field. Okay. So that's kind of an intuitive way how, uh, when you define your symmetry, you have to specify this uh, this topological network. But now that I have a one-form symmetry, I could do more things. I could add funny red dots at various at various uh, junctions. Good. So that, that can tell you that the, the junctions can be different if you have a one form symmetry. Good. Um, so now let's get, okay, so now we've understood that there are different junctions that you can write down once, once you have a one form symmetry. And now let's ask, how can the, can, can the anomaly for the zero form symmetry depend on, the, on this choice of junctions? And what, what I'll sketch is that the answer is yes, if, the system has a pure one form anomaly, or there is a mixed anomaly between the zero form symmetry and the one form symmetry. So, if these two, so these are necessary conditions, if, this, if, this, if these conditions are met, then the zero form anomaly can depend on the choice of fractionalization class or choice of network. Essentially. So, let me explain qualitatively why that's the case. So, as we know, tooth anomalies are essentially uh, captured by. Uh, inflow anomaly polynomials, so usually by topological invariant in one dimension higher. Okay. So here I'm just being very schematic uh, what I mean. So let A be the background gauge field for the zero form symmetry, and I just said before, B is the background gauge field for the, for the one form symmetry. And now let's write the kind of a generic anomaly polynomial that you can get. So this F of A is just depends on the background gauge field for A. So this will be the, the anomaly associated to the zero form symmetry. 
And then you can, if you have a, a, either a pure one form or a mixed zero form, one form anomaly, you, you could have an anomaly polynomial that depends purely on B or in B and A, okay? So now, as, as I said, changing a fractalization class is the same as adding these junctions or equivalently turning on background B fields, okay? So now you can see that if I turn on a background B field, but in this way, by changing the fractalization class, the pure zero form anomaly can be modified essentially because I, all I do is so substitute B by the fractalization class. So this shows you that if in, in either of these anomalies are present, you could change the value of the zero form anomaly. Okay? So that's kind of a very simple way to think about why the existence of a one form symmetry and a one form anomaly or mixed anomaly is important for the anomaly depending on the choice of fractalization class. So once you're there, as I said before, then you have to compute tooth anomaly matching. All anomalies have to match across all fractalization classes. It's not, it's not okay to just say anomalies don't match because you, you may have been comparing different fractalization classes. Good. Um, 10 minutes, John. 10 minutes, yeah, okay. Good. Uh, so let me give you a physical way of engineering uh, different fractalization classes. So one thing you can do, so imagine you want to construct a, a, a particular fractalization class. What you can do is consider adding to your theory massive particles, okay? Such that they break the one form symmetry. So that in particular, their charts stay under the center of the symmetry that was unscreened, okay? And then give rise to the one form symmetry. And you let this, uh, this massive particles transform in a projective representation of G, but in such a way that the zero form symmetry of the theory, namely the symmetry that on the local operator is still G, you have not messed with that. Then uh, we can ask, what does this do to the theory? Okay, of course, these are massive particles, so they should not really affect the low energy dynamics. Okay? But actually, in, in a sense, secretly they do. And the reason they do is because uh, these very massive particles in the at large distances essentially become line operators and these line operators being thought as the work line of the heavy particles. Mm. So by making different choices of fields that you have massive fields that you have in the UV, you're effectively dressing uh, line operators in the infrared by a different projective representation. And once you do this procedure, this, once you have fixed uh, this, uh, and if you don't have higher form symmetries that you may have to worry about, then that, that completely fixes the tooth anomalies for the zero form symmetry. Okay. Now you may worry, I told you before that anomalies are things that cannot, that cannot be removed at the local counter term. But usually massive particles, the reason they don't contribute to anomalies is because when you integrate them out, they generate a local term. But the reason that this philosophy changes, uh, there's a slight non-decoupling here, is that the choice of massive particles changes the symmetry structure of the theory in a discontinuous fashion. So this is not, it's not inconsistent with the usual decoupling argument. So that's one, very physical way to, to think about engineering different fractalization classes. Explore all ways in which you can break the one from symmetry uh, by adding new degrees of freedom and letting those trans the, the fields transform in some projective representation. Okay, another interesting way, physical way to, to change the fractalization class, which is very down to earth, is the following. This is particularly useful if you're studying uh, gauge theories. Okay. So, so imagine you have a gauge theory. Uh, let me now explain a few words how you can, what you can do to go from one fractalization class to another one. Okay. So what we can do is we can in, uh, 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 induce a change of fractalization class essentially by twisting the global symmetry by a gauge transformation. Okay. But in such a way that the, that the modified transformation, the combined gauge and, and global transformation, do not modify the symmetry algebra on the fields. Okay. So for example, here I chose a particular example. If I take the time reversal symmetry, usually people call this Z for P, we can uh, enrich the time reversal transformation by an element U inside the gate group such that the symmetry algebra is not deformed. Okay. So that's so now what, 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 I'll, what I'll comment is that doing this procedure can induce a change of fractalization class. So how, how, how would you know that you did that? I think that's, that's relatively straightforward. Essentially, twisting G by a, by a gauge transformation, essentially what it does is turn on a background gauge field. So A is now supposed to be the gauge field. So little A is like the, the, back, the gauge field 
the dynamical gets theory of your gets theory. And essentially doing this twist is equivalent to, to shifting the, the gates field by the background gates field for the zero form symmetry. So W1 is morally speaking the background gates field for time reversal. Okay. And then what you can see is what happens to the line operators that are charged under the one form symmetry once they do this transformation. And what you find remarkably is that what it does is uh, essentially transform the line operators that carry charge under one form symmetry by this particular phase. But this is precisely the phase that a line operator would transform if you turn on a background gate field with exactly this magnitude. Okay. So essentially what we have seen, I have sketched here is how performing a gate transformation acts on the line operators precisely how uh, shifting the, uh, the B field acts on line operators. So this is a very poor man's way of um, of uh, changing fractionization classes. I'm gonna poor man, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, okay, so now uh, in the last few seconds, oh, I mean, I mean, let me just have an example. So, uh, so the, by the way, this phenomenon is ubiquitous. It happens in all dimensions, including three plus one dimensional uh, QCD theories like n equals one super n mills. Uh, but let me show an, uh, uh, an example on how this affects uh, two phenomena. Dimension. So let's consider the following theory. Uh, we're in two plus one dimensions. Uh, we look at uh, with gates group SU to M, uh, QCD with one adjoint quark. Okay. So the, the first question you, you would want to know and is, is what, what happens to this in the infrared? So, well, a proposed answer to this was given some years ago with uh, Nati and, and Zohar, and that was the proposed answer. Okay. You get essentially a non trivial topological field theory. And, uh, anyway, one well, could say many things about it, but I don't have time. Okay. So now let's study some of the, the zero form symmetries in this theory. So one of them is the time reversal symmetry that squares like this. Okay. It's obviously known from the work of, topo of the classification of topological superconductors that uh, systems in, in two plus one D that have this symmetry have anomalies classified by Z16. Okay. So now how do you compute the anomaly? Essentially in, in a system of fermions, essentially what you do is you compute, you, all you have to do is uh, look at the number of fermions that transform and with a plus sign on the time reversal. So this is a canonical action of time reversal of Sierra Majorana fermion. So you just have to compute the difference of the one to control with the plus with the one to control with the minus. Okay. Good. So that's a statement about the zero form symmetry. This system has a, a one form symmetry that just acts in the center here and actually has a tooth anomaly, which I'm writing this locally in this way, uh, where B is the background gets you like that. The sign plus or minus depends on whether the, with the generating line that generates the one form symmetry has a spin one quarter or minus one quarter. But these are details. But this, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, what are the possible fractionization classes that you can have? So they're labeled by this cohomology group, which is a Z2, okay? And essentially what you have to do is just plug in the two possible values, uh, uh, the, the, the non-trivial background B field associated to this class. And what you find is that what this gives you, roughly speaking, is W1 to the four. And people like Nan will tell you that that topological term is equivalent to shifting the anomaly by minus four or plus four, depending on the sign here. So what we see in this example is that uh, the time reversal anomaly, the, 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 the jump in it uh, can, can jump by four, depending on uh, details of any even or odd, this is the matter at this level, okay? Good. Uh, so, okay, so then go to the details. So, this theory at one particular point in the phase diagram has a decoupled a massless fermion, which is uncharged, and that's that's called a Golskino. This, this theory just happens accidentally to have supersymmetry, but supersymmetry is not, doesn't play any role in, in this discussion of fractionization classes. So. But actually, it's very important when you do the two star anomaly matching of the zero form symmetry with the infrared, it's very important to take into account the contribution of the Golskino. Otherwise, you would get it wrong. Sorry, yeah, okay, yeah. So now, so now, what we can do is we can compute the the time reversal anomaly for different fractionization classes. So the most nice action of time reversal is, is where a P commutes with the get group and it transforms all the n square to n square minus one Majorana fermions in this way, and then the anomaly is this, is this just the dimension of the get group. Which mod 16 is minus one or three, depending on the parity of n. Okay. 
Now what we can do is, is, is try to see what the anomaly is if we change the fractionalization plan. And as I said, this can be implemented by a, by a gauge transformation that does not change the, the, the time reversal algebra. And here, as I said, you conjugate by u, and now you have to count. This will change some signs in some rows of, the, of this uh, two n square uh, of this matrix that John Quark. And you can compute the, the anomaly and you, uh, you get precisely, which is it's plus three and minus three. What you find is that you compute the difference between the two fractionalization classes, you get exactly what we had before. Okay. So you see that um, the perspective from the anomaly polynomial and the perspective from get transformation exactly match. Okay. And uh, since running time, let me just say that then what you can do is you can now take the inferred theory that was proposed. And check that indeed. So this theory has a contribution from, to the time reverse anomaly. This theory has a particular contribution to the time reverse anomaly. And what you find is that indeed it matches across all fragmentation classes. And this can be so. This was a particular simple example in which there was only a one-form anomaly for the for the one-form symmetry. In general, for for other theories with other quark content, you can have also mixed anomalies. And essentially, the lesson is that for all quantity theories for which the non-perturbed dynamics has been put forward, you can show, even though there can be many fractionalization classes, you can show that the anomalies uh, always work. Okay. Very good. So let me just conclude. Uh, so what, uh, what I wanted to say, uh, uh, can say is that specifying the action of, of, of a zero form symmetry requires specifying more data that perhaps you could have uh, thought of. Okay. And in general, distinct choices can give rise to different toothed anomalies. Uh, for the zero form symmetry, if there are one form or mixed zero form, one form anomalies. We found kind of a very physics down to earth way to understand how we can implement this change of conditional classes, either by adding massive particles and break the one form symmetry, or by uh, doing uh, twisting by getting transformation. Okay. And now that we have kind of a broader picture of what are the possible zero form anomalies given a, a one form symmetry, you have to kind of revisit. Uh, how uh, two star normally matching uh, works. So, with that, let me stop. Thank you, Rose, again for all your guidance and support, and happy birthday. You look even better now than here. I think that this picture is. I don't know, this picture I got, you know where I got it from? So, we organized this string in 2005. And that's the picture you gave a talk there. That's the picture it's there. So. In Toronto. In Toronto, yeah. 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 <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, the discussion of the symmetry is the product of one form and zero form. Yes, uh, definitely. One can do more complicated things and have a two group structure. And this is possible for this product. Yes, yes. Uh, in the paper, we also discuss examples where you have a, 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 a two group symmetry, but that's kind of a different story. That is that you misidentified what the symmetry of the system is. You thought that you have separately. A, a zero form and a one form, but actually the symmetry was not that, it was a different one, it was a two group. Here, in this, all these examples, the, the, the one form symmetry and the, and the examples I discussed here, the, the, the one form symmetry and the zero form symmetry factorized. That's why you can well define the fractionalization class. Yes, right. yes. Uh, we can just, I think in some, in some cases you can still make, you can give some definition of fractionalization class, even when you have a two group, but we can discuss that. In fact, the Toric code, Okay, let me know. We can discuss it in private. The Toric codes for a church of recognition class for time reversal actually yeah, have the two groups. But it, it, this would take for, for a while. Yes. Now, here's the thing to the talk. Yeah. Is it always the case that this subtlety is associated with H series okay, so this is or is it more general than that? It's more general. I have a theory that does not get H series. Can this subtlety arise? Yes, and, and, and I think an example of that is, uh, for example, if you look at well, in the infrared is described by the kind of the toric code. So there, uh, even if it's a bosonic system, there you can have uh, also time reversal anomaly, and depending on the choice of relation class, you can get the, the theory can be anomalous or not. That's a gauge Well, at a, long, a long distance is, but not a short distance. I mean, you, that's why I asked the question. Yeah. That's exactly what I asked the question. So the answer, sir? Yeah. So the way you presented it, in fact, this is the way that we stated the issue, the precursor of this issue in the earlier things, is that depending on how you calculate the gate thing, yes. depending on how you calculate that, combine it with the gate class, 
Well, the, uh, uh, no, no. So, so the gas transformation is a trick that we. So, so one thing that we didn't know back then is that the gas transformation likely implements the change of fractionalization class. That, in particular, it. But uh, so, so this method is used as a clutch to change the fractionalization class. You can change the fractionalization class even if you don't have any gauge theory at all. Just turn a B field and that's it. Or, or at a massive particle. So, even though that, yeah, so either just turn on a background B field, that will implement a change of fractionalization class. And this, this will be true in any system if it's gauged or not gauged, doesn't matter. And that will change the anomaly because of this argument of the anomaly polynomial polluting the zero form anomaly polynomial. All right, well, maybe one more, it's okay. Actually, I have two, two, two questions, but one of them is very brief. Uh, three one is, what was the row on H2? And the question is, uh, in this argument with junctions, uh, it seems like it can be extended to rolling vertical symmetry, perhaps with more. Yeah, so the, the first one is just, is, you have to, so row is the action of the zero form symmetry and the one form symmetry. So for example, you have charge conjugation, G, G can act on gamma in a non-trivial way. So rho captures that information, how G can act on gamma. And the second one, I would say that if you're enriched by non-invertible things, then it's related to Anton's story. You're not discussing the direct product of G with gamma, you're discussing some higher categorical symmetry story. So here I was just discussing G times gamma symmetry. If you change the, the symmetry structure, then everything has to be revisited. All right, this has been some great discussion. We should move on to the next speaker. Let's Thank go, you. John. <laughs>